Hi, welcome to Coda. I'm Ollie Flower. G'day, and I'm Roger Harris. Why am I always like set below you? That's your position in life. <laughs> Not surprisingly, given what we've been through in the last uh, two years, we're having to make adjustments yet again. So Coda has been postponed six months. We're moving back from April to September. So September 11 to 14 in Melbourne. It's going to be fabulous. So the good news is that means that more of our international friends will hopefully be able to join us. And we've got the, the split is there are two days of workshops followed by two days of the conference. And we've got an incredible program lined up for you. Incredible program, a, a good 50-50 split of clinical medicine, as well as all the other stuff that is so important to uh, us as healthcare professionals, all those other domains, and particularly the advocacy, the four pillars of, of CODA advocacy. So 50-50 split, all your CPD demands met. And we've been working on the CODA actions because CODA is about action, meaningful actions, and you're going to see more of that coming really soon. So watch out for that. Yeah, can't wait to see those actions. We've been holding them in reserve, but they're going to start coming after Christmas. Mm. So go to codachange.org, the website, register your intent for early tickets, and we are going to see you there because it is going to be off the hook. Is that, can you say that? <laughs> see you in nothing. <laughs> Welcome back to another uh, CODA podcast. I'm Roger Harris, and today I'm joined by none other than our very popular Victoria, otherwise known as Tori, uh, Victoria Stevens. And Victoria is an emergency physician in Johannesburg. She's known to uh, many of us in the SMAC CODA community and known to many of you on Twitter as EM Cardiac. Um, Tori and I have been friends for quite some years and uh, she is an inspirational doctor. She is uh, someone who I have very fond memories of being with at, uh, at SMAC and, and outside of those uh, SMAC episodes, she's been very helpful to me and my family at certain times with illnesses in, in South Africa. Um, and we've got to know each other a bit so away from, away from work. But Tori has, has been inspiring to me from the healthcare front because uh, I'd never forgotten the time that we were talking about surgical airways and she made the comment to me that she uh, kept a surgical airway on her desk at work and I said you know what, what do you keep that on your desk for and she said well you just never know I have to do a couple of emergency surgical airways with the gunshot wounds or whatever uh, every year and I said you do a couple of surgical airways every year and you know I've I think I got an interest in airways and I do like one in my entire career. Um, so she's the real deal. And uh, we're going to talk uh, in a two-part episode. Firstly, a little bit about trauma. And uh, then we are going to talk a little bit about how Tori has sort of manages herself and her life after some of those traumas. So in this part one, uh, Tori, I guess maybe could you set the scene for us and tell us uh, a little bit about your ED and, and what it's like, the sort of volume and acuity of where you work. I am an emergency physician. I run an emergency department in a regional hospital. Uh, so this would be a hospital that has 400 beds. Um, and yeah, we see a mix of trauma, medicine, pediatrics, gynae, and orthopedics. Our trauma ranges according to the time of the year. It has been quite different in the last two years because of COVID. Uh, we had very strict lockdowns in South Africa, which included the ban of alcohol um, for various uh, periods of the year. And this affected our trauma quite greatly. Um, during our strictest lockdown, the murder rate in South Africa dropped significantly. So it just showed to us how alcohol and trauma is incredibly linked in South Africa. Currently, we are at a low level of lockdown. Uh, so trauma is, uh, you know, back to its normal um, numbers. So frequently, we will see quite a, quite a few assaults. In South Africa, we've got an unfortunate uh, group of patients who uh, get injured as a result of mob justice. And these are patients who are accused by the community of committing a crime. 
And unfortunately, due to the prevailing sense of the community feeling that the police don't do enough um, to bring uh, people to justice, they sometimes bring upon um, justice in their own way and they end up beating patients up. So we see a lot of rhabdomyolysis as a result. And um, you know, this often requires us to treat patients with a lot of fluids, which we don't do in the standard trauma patient where we restrict uh, crystalloids and give them blood products and manage bleeding. So these patients with severe crush injury and rhabdomyolysis um, require quite a different take uh, to what we used to. But currently we've been seeing a lot of head injuries, lots of community assaults, as I've mentioned. Um, yeah, plenty stab wounds. And in my ED, I actually don't see many gunshot wounds. Uh, we're gonna talk about July a little bit later. Uh, which was incredibly different to what we normally see. We Maybe might see. I, I might just yeah. jump in there and just say, um, yeah. don't tease me with July. I mean, it sounded <laughs> uh, hectic. Tell me a bit about what happened. So, July was uh, the peak of our third wave. And the third wave actually brought by far the highest number of COVID cases in the country. We had only just started vaccinating our 60-year-olds and 50-year-olds. So vaccination rates were still extremely low, I think below 10% at the time. So we had a huge burden of COVID patients in our emergency departments. Our ICUs were completely overwhelmed. Uh, we were really in the midst of our worst wave that we had seen. And during this time, uh, the ex or the former president of South Africa got arrested um, for various uh, crimes. And this brought about a huge amount of violence in South Africa, um, which was initiated by his loyalists, but then spread throughout the country and became an opportunity for people to loot. So particularly in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, um, uh, which I know you've visited, Roger, for conferences in the past, and um, the province of Gauteng, where I live, this is where the violence became really extreme. So entire supermarket warehouses, uh, shopping malls were looted, burned down to the ground, um, it was extreme for about a week and a half. Um, it was actually during this time that we had huge numbers of COVID patients in our hospital. I had over 120 in my hospital when the looting broke out. And we had, on one particular day, it was a Monday, I had about 34 patients come in with gunshot wounds. Uh, to my department in 24 hours. And I have four doctors working at night and about six during the day. So we just managed gunshot wounds for 24 hours. And these were patients who were involved in the looting, uh, most of them, and we just had to carry on. Um, it was quite frightening because it was the first time in a very long time that I've actually felt like my personal safety was at risk. You know, my staff felt very much the same. And it was, these were the patients that we needed to manage, uh, the patients who were actually initiating the violence. So it was just really, really extreme what we were going through. So we had trauma patients as well as um, our COVID patients in the department. I'm not sure how many trauma patients got COVID as a result because we were just overflowing. And as much as we try to separate patients, you just don't know with the levels of ventilation. It's not like we have a negative pressure, um, you know, uh, set up in my department. I think the most bizarre thing that took place on that day is that 
you know, in the preceding week, we were very much aware that our oxygen capacity in the hospital was taking a lot of strain as a result of our COVID patients. So we relied very much on um, the oxygen delivery company. It's called Afrox in South Africa. We were relying on these enormous trucks bringing us oxygen virtually every day because our um, piped oxygen supply was running low with the huge demand. Fortunately, I'd actually worked with uh, the procurement department to buy lots of oxygen cylinders just in case we had actually um, run low of oxygen and, and needed them. I had no idea of what was actually going to take place. But during the riots, uh, there were trucks that were being targeted and torched um, during the, the looting and the riots. So Afrox was unable to deliver oxygen to our hospitals. They were waiting for an armed escort to take them to the various hospitals because they had to uh, go through areas that were unsafe. We just watched our oxygen supplies dwindle while waiting for this uh, track to arrive. Our oxygen pressures started dropping, our ventilators started alarming. Um, it was like a mad scramble to get our oxygen uh, uh, cylinders ready. Theater was running theaters with gunshot abdomens and they had to switch to cylinders because um, you know the uh, anesthetic machines were unable to run on the pipe supplies. So there was a rush to switch from gas to ketamine to keep the patients anesthetized. So yeah, it was just this experience of having two, like the pandemic, the COVID pandemic and our trauma epidemic colliding at once. I think whenever I'm going to um, complain about work, I'm going to ring you and uh, <laughs> just get you to tell me that story again, because it's, uh, it's quite overwhelming listening to that. I, th I think to most of us, uh, particularly those of us in Australia and the UK, where we don't see very many gunshot wounds, to see 30 gunshot wounds in a day, it's more than I've seen in my entire career. But to do that in the midst of a pandemic and then have the added disaster of running out of oxygen, um, I'm going to sort of come back to that topic because I want to revisit that with you but I'm, I just want to sort of pick your brain as someone who really works at the front line of trauma as you've just described and ask you when you're teaching your your residents what 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 are the sort of top things that you have developed that, you know what are your tips if you like for young players I think um, a lot of our experience comes from just seeing multiple uh, patients. I just encourage them to have a team approach whenever possible. We don't have the luxury of having trauma team leaders running a recess uh, because of our limited staff. But I do encourage them to, when there's a P1 trauma come in, stop what you're doing, all attend to the patient once the patient is stabilized, you can carry on uh, with your other patients. So using the team that you have uh, to, you know, just by everyone dropping tools, getting uh, control over that one patient. And then once the patient is stable, um, the single doctor can carry on with managing that patient. So that would be the one thing I would recommend to my juniors. I think another thing would just be the liberal use of ultrasound. I teach a lot of ultrasound uh, to my doctors. You know, we don't pan scan patients as much as other centers. Uh, we use it on a case by case basis, but most patients will, you know, have an EFAST chest X-ray and pelvis X-ray as a starting point. So I encourage them to learn ultrasound to practice, um, to do ultrasound on their medical patients, because plenty of our um, patients have a TB of the abdomen, so they tend to have lots of ascites. So you can use your medical patients to get comfortable diagnosing pericardial effusions, um, free fluid in the abdomen, so that when you are 
faced with an unstable trauma patient, you can do things quickly. I'm just interested. So the, you were saying uh, during the height of all of this chaos in July, you would have, did you say four doctors at night? Yes, four doctors. And, and yeah. what, sort of, what sort of, when you have that P1 trauma come in, what sort of additional support is there in-house? Who else is coming to help? Is there anaesthetic support? Is there surgical support? So, yeah, surgical support uh, for sure. No anaesthetic support. Uh, the reason for this is that they are in theatre constantly doing case after case, so we never see them in the recess room. Uh, that's why we need to do our own airways. I have no issue calling for help um, you know, from an anaesthetist when I think it is a difficult airway. We do call them and they come down if they can. But very often it's just us and the surgeons managing these patients. Wow. Hence why you have the uh, surgical airway kit on your desk. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so we've got a surgical kit um, on the recess trolley. But I have my own surgical kit um, on my desk or in my office because I just, I know that it's always there. I can pick it up and take it to the recess room when I'm being called. Because most of the time, my doctors won't call me for an easy airway. So as a consultant now, I do far fewer intubations than them. And when they call me for one, it's going to be difficult. So yeah, it's good to be prepared. Well, you'd be pleased to know, I, since you told me that, I keep one on my desk too, uh, just to keep the papers in the right place. And it's a paperweight. It's very helpful. I, I mean, this is a system that's obviously, uh, you know, a very different system to the system that many of us work in, in, uh, in, in sort of higher income health systems. Uh, you're working in a, in a, you know, very much a, a different environment. Um, and can you tell me, though, what works really well, do you think, as you sort of talk to your colleagues around the world, what do you think? Well, you know what, I think we do that really well. Our internship and community service uh, training that we go through. So in South Africa, it's a two year internship and we rotate through every discipline. So you spend three months in surgery, medicine and obsangani. Uh, to finish up Sangaini, you need to do 10 Caesars by yourself. And then in the second year, you do pediatrics, psychiatry, emergency medicine, and orthopedics. So I think this is an, and anesthetics, I forgot to mention. So I think that this is a really good grounding for junior doctors because you do, uh, you know, work in those different areas. So even when you go and specialize, you have some experience and insight into other fields. And I think it is another thing that we do well is, yeah, other doctors can come help because they still have those skills. I can think of a time a couple of years ago, we unexpectedly had a shooting take place um, at a hostel near my previous hospital. And we had nine gunshots come in at the same time. And the med reg put down what he was doing and he came to help and he came to recess and he put in an intercostal drain because he still had the skills. Um, he wasn't managing the patient himself. He was just saying, okay, where do you need me? Which patient needs a drain? I'll put it in. Um, so I think that's the, the type of thing that I think you know South Africa um, is good at is just having those skills and it's got to do with the undergrad uh, training uh, that we have. Um, yeah, and I think That's... we also specialize later. I can't imagine specializing straight after medical school. Mm. I would have been a surgeon, Roger. Like what? <laughs> I would have done surgery because that's what I thought I was going to be good at. Um, what, a, what a waste. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't tell Georgie I said that, but uh, yeah, that's it. That's uh, uh, yeah, I, I'd love that uh, and, and can't possibly imagine a uh, medical, uh, you know, registrar physician uh, attending my trauma calls and being of any use uh, at all. Um, because we just, as you say, we just don't have that breadth of training um, to do that. And um, we do spend a couple of years down here in pre-registration, 
but you know we don't do you wouldn't be expected to do during your ops and go any 10 seizures by yourself holy moly um so yeah you're obviously uh, thrown in the deep end at the start and get a lot of skills which is enormously valuable what what do you think is the the biggest obstacle i mean to me the obvious one is you know lack of resource would that yes. be the case uh, definitely lack of resources, uh, lack of staff. Um, yeah, and you know, uh, often things need a, a team approach, and you don't have a team, um, and you're having to manage a patient, um, knowing that you could do better if you had other hands on deck, but you're just having to do one thing after the other because you are resuscitating alone. Um, I just remember a night from one of my shifts as a registrar, I was on duty um, in a little ED by myself. And I ran recess by myself. I had, I didn't have a single other doctor with me. And I intubated three patients and I had to intubate them one after the other. So one patient was on NIV and the other patient was being bagged by the advanced life paramedic. And I just intubated them one at a time. But, you know, you, you know, each patient would have done better if they were looked after by a team, uh, rather than waiting for me to attend to them. So I think that's where we fall short. Um, I also strongly believe that, you know, having to do skills on a patient when you're not properly trained is a bad thing. And Fortunately, that is improving because of the availability of mannequins, um, the availability of better training. But if I think about, so I was an intern in 2007. I remember starting as an intern, um, you know, day one of my training and getting a crash course from the anesthetists on how to manage a cardiac arrest. And then interns were called to the wards to do cardiac arrests. And that was just not acceptable, but it was how it was done then. Luckily, you know, now in med school, you get training on how to manage a cardiac arrest, ACLS, BLS, et cetera. But yeah, back in those days, we didn't get that. So our patients uh, did not benefit from that. Yeah. So Vic, um, I mean, it sounds to me that, uh, you know, it, it, where you work is obviously incredibly challenging and, the, you know, but I guess at the same time, very, uh, you know, very enriching in another way. And, and I'd like to sort of come back to that uh, in, a, in a second conversation in a minute to, to sort of talk about that. What I took away from, uh, you know, what you've told me right now is the importance of of the team and certainly uh, everybody sort of, uh, you know, getting involved and trying to help out. And it sounds like uh, in, in adversity that uh, that's something that's probably really stood your team in good stead during those really difficult times. 